They breathe life into the stories of pop culture and teleport us into worlds of adventure. The gods and legends of Norse mythology has increasingly become a source of inspiration for the entertainment industry. How's it going, everyone? Arcanite Magician Girl here. Since three of you requested Nordics for the next Yu-Gi-Oh! Did You Know, they should be this episode's featured archetype. So sit back, relax, and get ready for some history on Norse mythology. Yggdrasil, tree of the world. Yes, Yggdrasil. Within it are nine realms. For organizational purposes, the monsters of the Nordic archetype will be divided into their respected realms, starting with Muspelheim, the realm at the very roots of Yggdrasil. Muspelheim is the land of fire, in which the fire king Surt is ruler of the realm. He awaits Ragnarok so that he may attack Asgard, the home of the Asir gods, and kill the gods within it. Although there are no monsters depicting him in the Nordic archetype, I felt some history on the realm was necessary nonetheless. Working our way up the roots of Yggdrasil is the realm Nilheim, in which the land of Helheim lies just beneath. Here we find Garm, our first monster in the Nordic archetype. Although I wasn't able to dig up much on Garm, he is often described as a Norse-like Cerberus. Assuming the duty as Gardog to the realm of the dead, Garm is described as being a monstrous blood-stained hellhound whose howling heralds the coming of Ragnarok. The realm of Nidvalir is up next, home to a dwarf-like race. The inspiration for the monster Dvurg has been forced into this category. In Norse mythology, the Dvurg are constantly called upon by the gods for their unparalleled skills at the anvil. Making an appearance in Thor, the Dark World, are the Svartalf, or dark elves that inhabit the realm of Svartalfheim. The Svartalf beings are said to hate the sun and dwell in the darkness of their homeland. According to Norse mythology, they are said to be the causes of great annoyances and troubles in the realm of humans. Among the beings said to create problems for humans were the subcategory of dark elves called Mears, or Mares. It was believed that these types of dark elves were responsible for nightmares, as they would sit on the chest of sleeping persons and whisper bad dreams to haunt them in their sleep. Being a variation of the Svartalfar, it should be emphasized that they cannot be exposed to extreme light, hence the sun lest they turn to stone. Onward to Jotunheim, realm of the frost giants and home to Loki. But before we continue, here's a word from Hulk. Enough! You are all of you beneath me. I am a god, you dull creature. And I will not be bullied by that. God. Both a god and citizen of Jotunheim, Loki is armed with an unpredictable tendency to either help or hinder the gods he associates with. While there are many myths that feature Loki, including how he committed bestiality and mothered the stallion Sleipnir, one Norse legend in particular explains the origin of earthquakes. After Loki orchestrates the death of the god Baldr, Loki is bound with the entrails of one of his sons. While bound, a serpent is placed above him, dripping venom, in which his wife collects in a bowl so that it does not drip on Loki. However, when she leaves to empty the bowl, the venom that drips on Loki causes him to writhe in pain, creating earthquakes. Fathered by Loki, Fenrir is the monstrous black wolf prophesied to kill Odin during the time of Ragnarok. In fact, when Fenrir's destiny was acknowledged by the gods, they began preparations for binding Fenrir promising that Fenrir's strength would become legendary if he manages to break specially forged shackles. The gods trick Fenrir into trying shackles of different strengths. In the end, Fenrir managed to break two sets of shackles, but was eventually bound by the third set named Glepnir. With the sword ran through his snout, pinning him to his platform, Fenrir awaits Ragnarok, where he will take his revenge by devouring Odin. Like his sibling Fenrir, Jormungandr also has a destiny facilitating Ragnarok. Due to this, Odin casts the giant serpent into the ocean surrounding Midgard, giving him the title of the Midgard Serpent. Also known as the World Serpent, because he grew to be so large that he was able to surround the earth and consume his own tail, as depicted by the Ouroboros, the world is said to end when Jormungandr releases his tail. Once there was a wager made between Odin and Rungnir, the Jotun giant, concerning which of them owned the fastest steed. Golfaxi, a name which means golden mane, 
was a giant steed, an adversary to Odin's mount, the eight-legged Slepnir. Golfaxi proved to be fast, but not as fast as Rungnir thought. Having lost the bet, Rungnir acts out in retaliation, forcing the gods to send Thor to handle the unruly giant. Halfway through the realms is Midgard, the realm of the humans. Are they intelligent? No, but they're very delicate. In fact, every time an asteroid strikes their planet, they have to begin life all over. But since we're nothing special, allow us to climb up the trunk of Yggdrasil to the realm of Alfheim, home of the Light Elves. Acting as the inspiration for the Nordic monster Leo Selfar, the Leo Selfar contrasts their dark elf counterparts. Said to be fairer than the sun, Leo Selfar act completely the opposite from the dark elves. Leo Selfar are depicted as angels, fitting since they are believed to inhabit the heavens. At last there is Asgard, realm of the Aesir in which Odin is king, but we'll get to Odin here shortly. Backtracking to the binding of Fenrir, what I didn't tell you was that by the time the third set of shackles was presented, Fenrir was getting suspicious. Reluctant to try on the third set of shackles unless someone put their hand in his mouth, insurance that he would be freed if he could not break free on his own, Tyr consented to the wolf's conditions and placed his right hand in Fenrir's jaws. When the gods failed to release Fenrir, after the wolf could not break free, Fenrir bit off Tyr's hand. Although there are several other legends Tyr appears in, this one explains Tyr's awkward left-handed sword hold in the depicted card art. Venatus of the Nordic Ascendant is inspired by Freya, goddess of love, sexuality, fertility, gold, war, and death. Also the goddess of fire, Venatus is the owner of the necklace Brisingamen, which is said to contain fire-like qualities. Nevertheless, according to Norse mythology, Freya's significance derives from the fact that she rules over a heavenly afterlife that receives half of those who die in battle, in which the other half are received by Odin's hall, Valhalla. Acting as the inspiration for the Nordic monster Valkyrie of the Nordic Ascendant, Valkyries are often depicted as winged women who hover over battlefields, reaping the souls of the best warriors and transporting them to Odin's Hall Valhalla. Norse mythology speaks of Odin transforming Valkyries into swans so that they could experience the realm of the humans. However, if they transformed into their true forms and were seen by human eyes, they would become human themselves and no longer be permitted to travel back to Valhalla. Also known as the Furious One, Odin is often depicted as a war god and bringer of victory, not usually without his eight-legged steed Slepnir, at least in Norse illustration. Odin is predominantly associated with war. Although Odin is also associated with magic, prophecy, and wisdom, his cunning is his most signature characteristic when faced with worthy foes. His wisdom, however, is not all his own. Once there was a war in the heavens between two groups of gods, the Asir, in which Odin is a part of, versus fertility gods known as the Vanir. During that battle, Mimir, an individual renowned for his knowledge and wisdom, was beheaded. Salvaging what was useful to Odin, Odin is said to carry the head of Mimir, as it recites secret knowledge and counsels him. You, what realm is this? Alfheim? Dornheim? New Mexico? You dare threaten me, Thor, with so puny a... What? He was freaking me out! Of all the children Odin fathers, Thor is the most known child. Often depicted as a golden-headed man wielding the hammer Mjolnir, Thor is the god of thunder, lightning, storms, strength, healing, and fertility. Although quite mighty on his own, Thor relies a great deal on two particular beasts in charge of pulling his chariot. Tangrasnir the Teeth Bear and Tangyoster the Teeth Grinder are the well-horned goats that pull Thor's chariot. Although Thor relies on them to taxi him across the heavens, Thor occasionally kills the goats and uses their flesh for sustenance. For Tangrasnir and Tangyoster, it is a never-ending cycle of living and dying as Thor resurrects them by using the powers of his hammer, Mjolnir. One legend tells of Thor sharing the meat of his goats with a peasant farmer's family, in which the son of the farmer breaks a bone to access the marrow within it, causing one of Thor's goats to become lame upon resurrection. I suspect that it is from this legend that Tangyoster's attack is lower than his counterparts. And that about sums up the Nordic archetype. While this episode was considerably longer than average, I hope every bit of it was interesting. I definitely had fun putting it together. 
Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and keep a patient eye out for any new uploads. And as always, if there's an archetype you're interested in learning about, suggest it in the comments below. Until next time, AMG out.